is Savannah, and I'm one of the naturalists here at the Okehele Nature Center. Today, we're going to talk about animal homes and habitats. Before we do this, we need to know what a habitat is. So a habitat is a natural place where both plants and animals live. This includes the non-living things like rocks and soil and rain as well. There are all kinds of habitats and they're found all around the world. Let's talk about a few of them. First, we'll talk about the habitat where this polar bear lives. It's very cold and snowy in this habitat. It's called the tundra and it's located in the polar region. This polar bear has special adaptations or characteristics, things that help him survive in the tundra. For example, the polar bear's fur is very bright white in color, which helps him blend in or camouflage to the snow. And it's very thick. His fur helps keep him warm in the cold environment. Now we'll talk about the environment or the habitat where you can find an octopus, the ocean. The ocean is a huge habitat and it's home to a lot of wildlife, like stingrays and crabs too. All of these animals have special adaptations that help them live underwater, like fins and gills. And finally, we'll talk about the habitat where you can find animals like this rattlesnake. The desert. This habitat is very dry and hot and sandy, and animals like polar bears or octopus might not live in the desert so well. However, animals like the rattlesnake have special adaptations which help them survive in these hot and dry environments. So if we think about the different habitats and we think about the animals that live there, we can start to see a connection. Animals have special adaptations that help them survive and be successful in their habitat. And an animal's habitat has everything that that animal needs to live. So now that we've talked about some of the habitats that you can find all around the world, let's go on a nature walk and investigate the habitats that you can find right here in South Florida. Along the way, we'll meet one of my fellow naturalists, Miss Emily, and we'll get to meet some of the animal ambassadors that live right here at the Okehele Nature Center. So here we are outside to discuss a little bit further about homes and habitats. So let's first define what a habitat is. It is where plants and animals, along with the non-living, all coexist and live together and grow up together, right? So it's sort of a nice little community within itself. So here we are in one of the most common habitat types here in Okehele Nature Center, as well as in South Florida. This is considered the pine flatwoods ecosystem or habitat and it is going to be dominated primarily by a pine tree, huh? It's the slash pine, and that's gonna be our tallest tree and making up the overstory. Below that is going to be our cabbage palm, which is also Florida's state tree. And then in the understory, coming down to about this level or my height, is gonna be our saw palmettos, as well as some other shrubs and vines like poison ivy, Virginia creeper, American beauty berry, just to name a few. Hi, we're here at the Deer Overlook. The Overlook looks out on our upper compound. The upper compound is an area here at Okehele Nature Center where some of our deer live. This upper compound serves as a home or a habitat for our deer. Now, any good habitat has four key elements. First, a habitat needs water. Second, it needs shelter. Third, it needs space. And fourth, it needs food. So as you can see behind me, there's a pond in this habitat. That is the water source for a lot of wildlife, including our deer. As you can see behind me as well, we have trees. These are the shelter in our habitat. We have our tall slash pine trees, which give our deer shade on the hot summer days. We have shorter cabbage palm trees and even shorter saw palmettos that give our deer a great place for shelter to hide. 
Now, deer in the wild need to hide from their predators or animals that hunt deer for food. Our deer have a fenced-in area, so they're pretty safe, but they still have that instinct to hide in their shelter. When a deer is young, it's called a fawn. Now, a fawn will have a special pattern on its coat. It's speckled or spotted, and this special pattern helps it camouflage or blend in to its shelter in its environment. As the deer gets a little older, that speckled coloring will go away, and their coat will be more of a solid brown, tan, or gray coloring. Now, this is because the deer, when they're young, spend a lot of time hiding on the forest floor. But when they're a little bit older, they're spending more time walking around with the herd foraging for food. Now, this brings me to my third key element of a good habitat, space. Deer need enough space to find their food. At Okihili Nature Center, our upper, upper compound is about four acres large. That means it's about the size of four football fields, because an acre is about the size of one football field. That's a lot of space for our deer to roam around in and live. Now that we've learned about three of the four key elements to a good habitat, let's take a closer look into our upper compound, talk about the fourth key element, as well as meet some of our animal ambassadors, our deer, that call Okihili Nature Center their home. So here we are in the deer compound, talking about that fourth element, food. And here we are with Handsome, one of our bucks. You can see as his antlers showcase themselves so well. And uh, white-tailed deer are considered herbivores, meaning they consume different plant matter. So from shrubs, woody debris, twigs, buds, even the fruit as well. And we supplement their food as well since they do have multiple acres to feed on in here. Uh, we also provide them some deer chow that is specially formulated just for them, as well as supplementing with a little bit of some treats and snacks like some apples, as seen, shown here, and even a little bit of a potato, and their base diet, a lot of leafy, leafy matter, so some kale and romaine lettuce it goes a long way. We even cut grapevine for them at the end of the day, which they enjoy thoroughly. And uh, let's talk a little bit about his antlers. So deer are very social creatures. They gather in groups called herds. And so the males, the bucks, they will accessorize with those antlers. They typically will shed them each year um, in time for the breeding season. So they can sport off other predators as well as other male bucks that are going after their female deer. So uh, that's it for here. Let's go find some of the does. So we managed to find one of our does here, and yeah, off camera is one of the older fawns, who now is a two-year-old. Um, but while we have our does here, you may notice her ears a little bit more versus the bucks who have those antlers. They don't. So the does here, we can really look at her ears and see how she uses her sensory organ in order to figure out what's around her and what's going on and think about any potential dangers and also get food as well. <laughs> so her ears are able to rotate completely independently of each other and rotate all the way around to get a surround sound uh, orchestra, so to speak. <laughs> and deer also have the amazing ability of sight. Um, so in order to keep an eye on for danger, their pupils are oriented horizontally versus let's say you think of a cat or another predator, they're gonna have more of a vertical orientation to see more binocular. They have a better peripheral vision. So they're able to see 310 degrees around them to give them and be able to see or feel anything around them, any dangers, um, because again, they are a prey species as well. So other features is that sense of smell. They have 500 to 1,000 times more acuteness um, in their sensory or in their nostrils specifically versus a human. So their sense of smell is closer to a dog, and so they're able to find their food really well, as well as also smell out any potential dangers. Right? Yeah. So 
there you go. We have our does and well, baby didn't, or the, the baby did not come and uh, get featured in today. But thanks for joining us in the deers. <laughs> So we just learned about our deer and what they like to eat, but we have more than deer here at Okahili Nature Center. We have rabbits and birds, butterflies, just to name a few, right? Um, so we supply a lot of supplemental food for these critters for viewing pleasure, for your viewing pleasure, as well as a way to supplement from habitat that was maybe lost. So for example, we have bird feeders. And the bird feeders have a, a variety of different types of seeds and nuts in them. And that is great for birds who are granivores or seed eaters. And we also have squirrels that will frequent as well as white tail or cottontail rabbits. And let's see, some armadillos as well. So uh, for other examples for food outside of this would be the butterfly garden, which we'll go to next. So here we are in our butterfly garden planted by staff and volunteers over the past several years. These are going to be your food resources for these insects, which are also herbivores, just like our deer, right? So they're eating different types of plant matter. These are going to be depending upon the different species as well as the different life stages of the butterfly. So let's start off with an egg. Those eggs are laid on specific uh, host plants. They hatch out into caterpillars. Those caterpillars may feed only on one specific type of plant, like the Atala butterfly. They're only going to eat the Kunti plant. Um, and then once they metamorphose into the chrysalis, they're going to emerge as a beautiful butterfly. Those butterflies are going to have a completely different mouth part, and they'll have a proboscis so that they can access the special part of the flowers so that the nectar is deep down in that nectar lobe, right? So they have different mouth parts. So you have the kids that are eating or the caterpillars that are eating the leaves and then the adults that are sipping the nectar. In addition, we have, let's say, the fire bush here, which is a great host or nectar feeding plant for the zebra longwing, which is our state butterfly, as well as Gulf fritillaries, which is another species of butterfly here. By having all of these different butterfly species, you are then helping the next predators or consumers out. So our insectivores, which we'll go learn about, they are going to eat those bugs. So by planting, you're helping the food chain and help that food web out in a great way. I'm here at one of the ponds on our property. Just like the pond in our upper compound where our deer live, this pond creates a great water source for a lot of wildlife. However, ponds are not only just a water source, but they're also a habitat for all kinds of animals. Can you think of an animal that might use the pond as its habitat? Well, if you thought of a fish, you'd be right. This pond is a freshwater habitat for freshwater fish species, like the mosquito fish. That's a small fish species that eats mosquito larvae, or young mosquitoes. The pond is home to all kinds of wildlife. There are tiny microscopic organisms that are so small you need a microscope to see them, called phytoplankton that live in the pond. There are invertebrate species, which means they don't have a backbone, like insects that also live in the pond. Insects often have a larval stage that's aquatic or that lives in the water. So the pond is very important for their life cycle. There are also amphibians like frogs and salamanders that also have an aquatic larval stage. These animals spend a lot of their time as adults near the pond too. There are reptile species like water snakes and aquatic turtles that live in the pond and spend a lot of their time swimming around looking for their food. These animals have the ability to come onto land in order to bask in the sunlight. This is important because reptiles are ectothermic. This means that they are cold-blooded and they need the sunlight and the warmth and the heat from the sun to get their energy in order to catch their food. There are lots of bird species that live near our pond as well, like the great blue heron and the egret. And these birds have special adaptations, like their beaks, that help them find their food. 
Great blue herons and egrets eat a lot of fish, and their beaks are specially shaped to help them catch their prey. Now, if all of these animals depend on this pond as their habitat, that means it has to have those four key elements. We know the pond has water and food, but it also has space and shelter. There are lots of different aquatic plants that provide shelter for wildlife in our pond. There are three main groups. The first are the submerged aquatic plants. Those are the ones that grow underwater, so we can't see them from here, but they're under the water and they provide thick areas of vegetation for animals to hide in from their predators. Then there, there are the emergent plants, or the plants that grow out of the water, and they provide shelter for wildlife as well. Finally, there are the floating plants, which are like lily pads. They grow and they float at the surface of the water. These provide shelter, but they also often provide food for lots of wildlife. They produce seeds and berries, and animals come and eat them as well. So, Natural shelters, like these aquatic plants, are very important. Unfortunately, some areas don't have as many natural shelters as they used to. So we build artificial shelters, or man-made shelters, to help out the wildlife. If you look way out into the pond, you might be able to see a wood duck box. This is an artificial shelter, or a man-made shelter, that we have built to help female wood ducks while they are nesting and laying their eggs. This provides a safe place so they can do this and not be harmed by predators. Wood duck boxes are just one of the many examples of artificial shelters that we've created and put out in nature to help our wildlife. In just a moment, Miss Emily is going to talk about some of the other artificial shelters that help out animals. Before she does this, can you think of any man-made things that might be around your house or maybe your neighborhood that help wildlife? So in addition to the wood duck boxes, we also provide artificial shelter boxes <laughs> for some other animals near the pond habitat that require a little bit more open field but still near water. These are for two flying animals both of them feed on insects or take on the role as insectivores. So they prey on bugs, one being a bird and the other being a mammal. And both of them occupy a different role, one being a nighttime and one being a daytime bird. So let's start talking about this box right here. This looks a little bit more condo style and this is for the purple martins. Purple martins are a large swallow species of bird and they are a declining species or a species of concern. So we work with our local Audubon chapter to help find the right elements for the purple martins to make sure that they succeed as best as we can get them to. So we provide them the home. We have the right amount of space for them to feed on a plethora of bugs during the daytime. So that makes them diurnal. One of their favorite type of bugs are dragonflies. And those dragonflies start off their life cycle in the pond. So you see how everything is connected here. In addition to the habitat requirements, so we've got food, water, shelter, and then space. So we've got all four elements here for the purple martin. If we take a look at our other box, this is going to be for a mammal but instead of a diurnal, this is going to be a nocturnal species. If you guessed bat, give yourself the pat on the back <laughs> because these bats are also occupying that same role as insectivore, but are feeding on those bugs that are also nocturnal, like a lightning bug or maybe mosquitoes. All good pest controllers and a great way to control uh, the amount of insects that are in your yard without paying an arm and a leg for it. So you can provide some of these different artificial shelters in your yard to create a backyard habitat for whatever animals you might choose. But making sure that you have the right four elements of food, water, shelter, and space so that you can too enjoy 
all of these animals and plants and see what homes and habitats you can find in your own yard. We hope you've enjoyed our virtual experience today and I hope you've learned so much about animal homes and habitats. If you have any questions, be sure to ask your teacher and they can reach out to us. Or you can come visit us here at the Nature Center. Our trails are open from sunrise to sunset and the Nature Center is open from Wednesday through Saturday. Thank you so much for listening and learning with us today. We'll see you soon.